there's nothing more important than keeping a name and keeping the brand out there as long as you can. I think that's like the 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 big secret in the sauce or whatever. You're either extremely good and undeniably talented, or you've been a you've been around long enough to be a veteran and eventually somebody recognizes you have enough talent to be like on the road with and open or whatever else and they'll give you throw you a bone. Welcome to So what um what was your favorite what was your favorite part of like being in a band? <laughs> I could like scratch the surface there. Like I don't know if we should dig into I don't know, like the dream chasing the dream or like the process. Like what what brought us into music, what what it, what got us our start. I just remember Mike, uh, our buddy Mike playing Enter Salmon on guitar and I'd been like, Oh, it's it's cool. I wanna learn how to do that. That's that was how I started into music. Yeah, I, for me, it went in like phases. Like when I first got my first guitar, I was 15 years old. I had a Yamaha G810. It's a real piece of shit, and I had a like the little you know the combo amp and guitar. And the, even rewinding back from there, I my mom had a classical acoustic guitar that had like three strings on it, and that's what I would play like all the time. And like I was like figuring things out on my own, like chords and things like that. And then I got finally she, she I played on it so much she bought me a guitar, and I was never good at guitar like ever. But there was something about like the sound I really enjoyed, and I started listening to more music. For as far as like being in a band goes, I didn't. There was a, when I moved to Two Rivers, it's where you live and everybody lives. That means that's <laughs> from. Yeah. where everybody <laughs> lives. Everybody in the world lives in Two Rivers, but all the people that are really associated with this podcast, but that area. Um, <clears throat> I went to a local show and I saw a Your Band and I saw Lead and um, I was like just in, oh, and then Profane. And really, sorry, sorry, it wasn't your band that inspired me. But when I saw Profane, that really, it was at the community house, this local shitty show. But I was just like, I first time ever, I've never been to a concert or anything before. And I saw that and I was just fucking enamored. With that's like what heavy that sound. Yeah, that, I was going to say, that's what gave you the, the spark to do it was like seeing Profane. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. And, um, yeah, and there's something about live metal music. Yeah, and I still get that to this day. I'll like, you know, I'll go to like Summerfest and I don't really go to shows anymore, but I'll see like outdoor venues for some reason that's acceptable to me now. But um and just there in that live, you know, that growl on the guitar and all that, that stuff and just something about that atmosphere I just really really loved. So, so you're asking me what my favorite parts were. Really it was the bond between the group of guys i liked the back and forth and all that um but more so the writing process and that's where i excel and that's what i really enjoy is the writing process i think i get a high from that more so than playing live i get more of a high from writing something that i created versus anything else see i um uh, i remember being such a tool slash douchebag when i was a kid I must I must have been like sixth grade and like going to a girl's house with a bunch of people. It was like the first times that you like had, you know, multiple sex gatherings and you're just like <laughs> as, as as in people, not fucking orgies when I'm six, uh, sixth grade. But I remember um, going to this chick's house and her dad had like a really like a bunch of nice, really fancy acoustic guitars and I remember just saying, oh, yeah, I know how to play. And she's like, oh, really? And I was just like, yeah. And I remember sitting down, and I just, like, strummed the strings, and I didn't know what the fuck Weird. I was while I was doing it all. And, like, I think she just humored me. In my head, I remember her just being like, oh, wow. But, like, I didn't play anything on the neck. I just strummed all the strings as they were. <laughs> and... <laughs> Having this conversation just brought that. I haven't talked about that since that day. I've never heard you say that before. 
Yeah, I fucking played a guitar without playing any chords or anything, showing off to a girl before I even knew how to play guitar. <laughs> That's fucking brilliant. I was destined to do it. But yeah, the funny sure. thing is, I never got girls from doing music. And, like, you know how everyone talks about that being a specific reason to start being a musician? Like, oh, get some chicks. And you're like, oh, boy. Like, that never really happened for me. I don't know why. I, I had no confidence when I started playing out and... <laughs> Even, even like, this is going to sound incredibly douchey, but, like, our high school band, for some fucking reason, was very exciting, and a lot of people gave a shit about it. I don't know why. We weren't very good. We were, but we would play shows for, like, you know, a couple hundred people, and when you're that young and you get that kind of an ego boost, like, you would think you would be more confident because everybody else in the band walked like they were gods. They would pull shit. They would do all this stuff. And I was always this like timid, quiet guy in the background that was like extremely <laughs> loyal. I was always extremely loyal to the projects, but it, it's weird. I just, I remember always being like really nervous around girls or even fans. I never knew what the, you know, people would be like, oh, awesome show. I'd be just like, yeah, I, I screwed that one part up. Or like, I would always, yeah. you know, like try to take away the, the praise and all that. That kind of yeah. stuck for a long time. But sure. yeah, yeah. From uh, from starting from that showing off to that girl at that house party, all the way on, I eventually learned a few songs. I learned quick, but it wasn't like I got good quick. It's just like I went from like knowing jack shit to understanding basic tablature and then putting songs together. That was, I guess, the easier part on my beginning was being able to somehow in my head music made sense to write it. And I mean, me and you have worked for years on projects and. Like, I've always been able to write, and I don't know where that came from. I have no yeah. idea. Like, it wasn't like a, I didn't practice at it. I didn't learn how to do it. I just always did it, which is a very yeah. bizarre thing. Like, uh, everyone claims something, you know, when, any musician I ever worked with, it's like, oh, I'm uh, good at lyrics, or, oh, I know music theory. Oh, I know this. And it's like, I, I'm not that great of a player, but I put things together, and I don't, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> Just, I don't even have a good ear. <laughs> like I don't have that great of an ear, but I understand like yeah. chord organization. <laughs> yeah, I, I think me. And, I think that's why we've we've always worked well together. I think me and you are kind of cut from the same cloth that way. Like I'm not this stellar musician. I've never have been. I've never. I never really aspired to be. Like to be honest with you, I've never really wanted to master an instrument or anything like that i like putting things together that i hear in my imagination or in my head and just making that come out you know or you know obviously i think me and you have mastered that portion of it i know like you said you know we, we can write together pretty quick and well you know probably faster than a lot of people and probably a lot of bands but uh, yeah, as far as you know, anything that uh, as for for me, I've I've never been able to master an instrument. I don't know music theory that well. I do, and I and I find you know I've worked with people who are really amazing musicians, and I don't like working with those people. To be honest with you, I don't because I there's all of a sudden you, you get into these situations where you're like you're writing someone and like well, and usually these type of people, I'm not downing anybody because music is completely subjective you can do whatever you want with it and that's how there's, i feel there's a fair amount of people that like like to say that's not a thing but i definitely agree with you on that yeah i, I mean, mean it's, it's subjective well, you can't, <laughs> yeah you can't do that 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 all sounds stupid and it's like well you haven't tried it now i don't know how many times you've heard that like well, well just try it you know it's probably like number one arguments and bands when we're writing songs and um yeah it's it's just really interesting there's really like a couple different types of musicians out there on you know how how things are written but again, I, I think it goes to show too. There's a lot of amazing musicians that never will be heard of or anything like that, and can't write a song to save their life. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that like I'm this great songwriter or anything, or neither of us. But I, you know, I know what we're capable of, and it, the, it's it's always just been interesting how that works. The the funny part about our writing style is, it's so it it one it's easy. It just mm. comes together, like, and I also just, like, I, I don't know, it's, like, the less I, this is going to sound weird coming from a musical standpoint, but, like, 
the less I care, the easier it goes. It's like you just, uh, you know, when you look at it at face value, like, oh, okay, here's like, I've literally sent you the weirdest, dumbest riffs. I, I, sometimes <laughs> I do it on purpose just to see what you'll do with it. Yeah. And then you yeah. send me uh, your rendition of it. And it's just like, makes sense. Good to go. And I could go, I could go in and tweak oh, this transition is missing this. Sure. And oh, why don't we go to this chord or why don't, and like, you can do all that. But I think like, I like the picture of music as, you know, like a, a spine and then like you're filling in the ribs and c completing the skeleton. I've always kind of used this in an uh, analogy or metaphor for music, but like it gets to a point where you're taking rib one and putting it where rib two goes. And then like nothing really changes significantly to the song. And I get it. I get into a lot of headbutting battles with other musicians and other projects that I've been in because they'll bring something to the table that is just as good as something that I brought to the table. And I'm like, well, that's not better. And then there's the big pissing argument about which one you should use. And a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I don't care. We'll use yours or vice versa because it's not, it's not better. But like, I've never been the type of musician to like deny acknowledging when something's better than what I brought to the table. And right, I think like, right. I think that's something you go through maybe younger on. I, I don't know if we're like going through the, the writing process or the, the band dynamics you have to deal with when you're, when you're working with other people. But it always seemed like the, there's a handful of guys that I can work with consistently where it's not, we can get stuff got, done, but there's certainly people that I work easier with than others. And I've worked with some very bullheaded players and I'm, I'm bullheaded myself yeah, and it, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> I used to like crave that. I used to crave that battle. It almost yeah, felt battle. like that. Yeah. I think you can remember <laughs> that from the great town fire days. It was oh, like, we yeah. showed up, yeah. We showed up, you know, putting our fucking wrist tape on and getting ready for fucking boxing match. And we go into practice and it would just be like, here's fucking everyone's idea. And everyone wanted their idea done at once at the same fucking time. And you could never get anywhere. You could never get anything done. And then when you finally squeezed out something, it was a compromise between six people that nobody liked. And that's just that was like what uh, Great Town Fire was. And it, it was such a mess. Thank God. Thank God for the digital age. Now where it's like, you just take a riff and you can do so many things with it. And like, it's not, yeah. yeah, it's not organic, but if you have the mindset for music, like it's, it's like, okay, if you know how to write music and you give it to a professional, they can create your vision. Well, now you have the ability to write something and put the sound that you envision to your vision. So it's yeah. not like, I don't look at it as like a cheat necessarily, although there is like a, there is a point where like I kind of like draw the line a little bit, you know, like uh, it depends what the application is. You know, if you if you're mm -hmm. writing a bunch of, of backtrack stuff that you can't actually perform live, you know, if like a horror orchestrated stuff that can't be redone because it's humanly impossible oh, sure. or stuff like that. I agree that that stuff should maybe take a back seat or be labeled as hotel art or that level of <laughs> quality where it's like not quite, you know, reality. But I don't know if it, it doesn't necessarily have to be discredited. I I went I went on a weird angle here. Wow. How do well, we end I up? Mean, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, there's so many facets to this whole thing. I mean, but I mean, kind of. I'm gonna piggyback off that a little bit. You know, as far as like I think we're talking about like production. You know, as far as like writing when you're writing stuff and it's like I've always been of the mind of like you put out a CD, you put out that that's really what what your your bread and butter is right you're gonna put out something that people are gonna listen to and i've never had any qualms with um like overproduced or over like you know orchestras and stuff like that and stuff because you know live dynamics different i think it's two different uh fields you're playing in you know you play live i almost feel like you should play a little different than what's on the album you know and things like that um just because it's like it's a different feel you know it's a totally different different you know why not give somebody two different types of shows that you you can because it's it's a it's a it's really two different faces to what you're doing i mean how many times have we talked about our plans for playing out live and like what you know where should we dress a certain way look a certain way do this and that um and we can get into that too but i kind of want to go back to also about like you know starting off with a riff or like sometimes you send me things that are just really bare but like people need to realize and maybe and you know i've gotten wiser with the years you know I, how i put things together now and, and we've kind of seemed like we 
the stuff we recently have been doing it seems like we've, we've kind of grown together in a way even though we haven't worked together in years but suddenly it's like we've matured a little bit and i think it's if you think your riff <laughs> this is my advice out there if you think your riff is gonna save your band you're fucking wrong you can literally <laughs> make something cool out of anything and having that mindset going in is i mean man i don't know how i want to tackle this because i can go into like band dynamics and like you know about who's in charge and who's this no i definitely i definitely want to step into that a little bit yeah but but uh i think you're i think when you bring up the idea of like a riff make or break in a song it's like um yeah. No matter what you do as a musician, your vocalist will reign supreme over anything you ever choose to do. You're not, and the more basic style of music you do, the more that's apparent. So if you're like a rock writer, then you could write a thousand bar chords and it don't fucking matter. Like it just, <laughs> as long as you got a good singer that can put a good melody over some, keep it the simpler yeah. you keep it sprinkle in the spice afterwards i mean i that that's probably the the best way i can describe how i've gotten better at writing over the years now mind you would you you know if you're talking about the genre that i'm writing for is it Mm. better is it more tech is it more advanced no but it's more appropriate to leave room leaving room and space for other creativity makes a better song if you try to put in six guitar parts because you want to just fill it and fill it and then you put drums and you want to have this much drums and this much and this much your singer comes along and they can't stand out or they got to get you know they have no idea what to do like i would love to have a singer give me a piece of melody that they just sung and try to write the other way around because i've always always been saying that yeah i I started (laughs) off writing as guitar riff and then you put drums and then you fill in the rest nowadays the way the you know, the development of all these, you know, softwares and stuff you can use. Writing drums is my preferred way. So I'll place drums Mm -hmm. first. And then I I actually write, it's weird. I'll write out the drums all the way through before I have a riff in mind. I don't even touch my guitar. I just do drums. Like I want to write to this kind of beat and I want it to do these things. And then when I get done with that, I play the whole song on loop and I just fart around. And then sooner yeah. or later, just things start trickling through. And sometimes it's really dumb. And sometimes it just works. And like, because the drums, I always thought the drums were like, you know, hand in hand with like the, the like I said, the skeleton metaphor, but the spine, you know, you got your drums and your rhythm guitar, like right down center. And then everything else is going to be, you have to get that first because then it'll change and you'll make your adjustments for everything else later. If you try to go with all the outside shit and work your way in, it's a harder battle and you start yeah. losing you start losing the the basic concept because you can scratch everything you worked on. Like if I'm if I'm doing all the drums and I'm writing guitar and I fucking hate what I'm writing, I can scratch all that. Go have a cup of coffee, go for a walk, go do something and then come back and a completely different song will come out of that. I even did mm-hmm. this in my most recent band. I'm in uh, uh, Brett would send me drum tracks for uh, for uh, scratch tracking for the newer material that we're writing. And we, he'd also send me the old stuff, too. And we would write, you know, just scratch tracks so everyone can practice, you know, through the pandemic and everything. We wanted to have this stuff so everyone could practice. So I started doing that. But then I would take songs that we already did and I'd make completely new songs with the original drum tracks they did. And then I'd make another yeah. one and then I'd send it to them. And this was the funny thing where I like, you know, not to call him out or anything. And it's fine. I, I get why he thinks this way and it's not a wrong way of thinking, but no. I show him the new thing. He's like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I can't really see it because it's got the same drums. It's like, you're giving too much power to a beat, man. Like it's the just beat, the reality yeah. is like drums are not, drums don't make a song like they they just they can they give it a feel for sure well, yeah, but like yeah, there's yeah. only so many feels you can do there's only so many you're limited in that sense in the creative side as far as you know the new age metal it's not even new age metal what the hell do you call what we what i write nowadays i don't know it's butt like rock back to new metal. i don't know i mean it's it's not a complicated know. writing style so it doesn't need a complicated like theory behind what you're creating yeah but when you get into like even the more complicated stuff and you have um 
you know, progressive stuff and all that chaotic, you know, really thought out, really masterful performance, that stuff all starts bleeding into the same kind of concepts too. It's like, it's, it's any genre I've ever stepped into, you can start seeing the patterns. And once you understand the patterns, then it all just kind of falls together. It's kind of unique yeah. and interesting. Like I haven't seen or heard a really unique band in a long time. I think Other Lives might've been the most recent one, but they still take like, classical elements and mixing in with more of that like indie rock or whatever yeah um i don't know if you yeah, ever heard I mean, them but no I've, I've never heard i'll have to check that because i've actually i'm i've been on a drought on like new music for probably two years like yeah i hate almost everything i hear now and it's not to sound like arrogant or anything i just don't i i i've gotten so into my writing in the reason last year it's like that's all i care to listen to now and i know it's like sounds super vain probably a lot of people that are like you you know like but it, it's you know i don't know it's when you got an ear that gets bored you know it's just what happens but yeah i mean to the writing i mean yeah understanding that everything like talking about the the, the drum track thing there you know it's it's all about harmony between the instruments i mean it's and you, knowing where you stand you know you you're a guitarist you it's so easy to do this especially in the band you write your part, right? And then you're in your head, you're already going, okay, the guitar should do this. And I, I hear the drums doing this. And, you know, you may even touch on the vocals, like, oh, I, I can hear this melody. You, you do all this stuff because you're excited, right? Like you write a part and you want the song to turn out. And some bands figure out how to work it. Maybe a guitarist will be responsible for this one song and then, you know, a drummer will be responsible for that song. But I think the problem with that is that you kind of lose an identity that way sure. in a band, uh, you know, um, and we can get into like band dynamics, but, you know, I, I'm, I used to be of the mind that, and I, I've grown from this. I used to be of the mind that it's just a collaborative effort. And if everybody can just get on the same page, you know, what you're asking for is fucking ridiculous. If you actually think about it to that's, get people, if you hurdle. have, you know, group, right. And especially it's harder, the more people that we had a, what was terrorizing six members. Yep. When you got six people, well, let's say five of them were really, well, let's say four of them. Well, let's say three of them were really passionate about like what they're writing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> even with three who are very, <laughs> who are very passionate about what that sound is going to sound like. You may have all qualified musicians, all qualified writers, but you may have this dynamic that almost it's like a relationship it may almost even turn toxic at times when you, are writing stuff that you're not happy with one two that you feel like you're not getting your say in. And I think understanding your role in a band, I, I am of the mind now there should really be one leader and whoever that is, it could be the guitarist it could be this and that, but like knowing your place in the band is really fucking important. You know, I would have done things differently with the thought process that I have now. Um, you don't need all these minds um, leading the way, you know, you need somebody who's going to bring the whole song together in the end. You can write your part, but you really need to, and a lot of times it ends up being the vocalist or, but maybe it's not, maybe it's the guitarist, whoever's the strongest writer in your band should really be responsible for writing the songs. Um, that, and I think that's, that's kind of what happens. Oh, yeah. But I think that's kind of what happens between, you know, me and you have a very harmonic way on how we write, you know, you, it, it, we kind of shift our responsibilities. Like if you send me a bare bones guitar track, I'm taking the leadership role on that. I'm going to go, okay, well, I'm going to make some decisions here and I'm going to cut this and that. And if I send you like a synth thing or something like do some of this, you're going to make executive decisions with that song and don't get too attached to your songs. I mean, everyone thinks they're, you know, it's like most musicians, just because you created something doesn't mean it's fucking going to save your band. The, you know? the, best, like, the best thing to happen when you when you send something off to somebody else and they put their own spin to it and then you get upset, oh you get upset with their decisions. It's funny to me now because thinking about it, it's like if you're upset at them, then you believe that they wanted to ruin your song. Yeah, and, and that's not what they were doing. It was they were doing their own interpretation of the music, and like, is it wrong? Is it better? Is it you know? Oh. 
But when you, like you said, when you don't have the designated writers and the the roles understood between musicians in a band, that's where you run into the problem of, okay, we got to take fucking, you know, I don't know, Jordan, Jordan, whoever wrote, wrote a song, here it is. And everyone's <laughs> like, oh, yay. And then we hang it on the fridge <laughs> and like everyone gets to see it. And we all know it's crap. And we all, you know. When you have those moments of, they, they just kind of get in the way. I think that's uh, the best, best way to describe it. Because I've worked with, I've been in bands. You, me and you have been in bands with like very strong creative writers, and some yeah. of the, it's weird being in the area because this this little lakeshore area has has some of the best it's musicians, so or not yeah. not necessarily musicians like worldwide musicians, but some of the best capable writers of material that yeah. I've never seen in other areas. We've traveled, we've played all over, uh, we've seen other bands, we see all this stuff, and it's like, nobody, like, I mean, I, I, might, I can name, like, six people, six individuals right off my hand that are, like, extremely creative, yeah. over-the-top yeah. writers in this area, and it's kind of mind-blowing. But the problem is, there's been a lot of projects I've been in with all those members in the band, and you run into that, you know, the creative waves or the creative space, and depending on whether or not you're trying to make your solo project something, because I've seen that before too. Like, me, you know, there's been, I've been in bands with somebody that should be just doing their own solo project. I've been there and that's fine, but like they don't, they don't write well with other people. And recognizing that right away can save some headaches. And, you know, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be looked at as a negative thing. If you're if you're writing with uh, people that are more uh, compliant or just going with the flow, that's also a good thing. You know, not having having somebody that'll just do their basic part. I think we know who we're talking about here. Just shows up and loves to just be in a band and like will yeah, just yeah. do his part. <laughs> He's one of my, like okay. So Jeff Jeff is definitely one of my most favorite bandmates out of all oh, the yeah. years out of all the years i've never fucking argued with him i never had any nope. Nope. he just shows up he plays his part sometimes he slacks i yell at him then he gets his shit together like it's never <laughs> it's it that's the most drama he, he ever brought to the best bandmate anybody could ask for i mean it's just on that side he, he would be yeah. if, if you had to rely on him to write the songs well then that would be really interesting no, he, <laughs> but that's never, not his role and he understands that you know he Guy will straight up tell you like I don't want to fucking write, <laughs> write that shit. Just, I'll just play it, you know. And like it's it, and but that that's it's those revelations that like made me realize that you know, um, the just because like everyone's like putting together like a super group and just because you got a bunch of really good writers doesn't mean you're gonna put out good shit. I mean it's just the way it is, you know. Or it'll be a fucking struggle to get there to make sure everyone's happy and then you got to worry about the band dynamic where okay do you have salty members hanging out with holding on the grudges and shit like that and you, you see it in the in the success world too i mean you see it all the time with like famous stories with you know uh guns and roses and fucking uh sticks and all that you see that shit all the time oh for sure but uh what's that i said oh for sure that's uh yeah that yeah. that those drama situations and, and i'll openly say it i'm a I'm kind of a shit talker when it comes to the groups. I, I'm not, <laughs> it's not like I want to, I just like to vent it off. So I might, it's like always a process of working up to the point where I address it to the person almost, but yeah. it's like, it's like therapeutic to just kind of vent off and be like, Oh, fucking Steve's really slacking, man. He's, he's pissing you off. Oh yeah, I guess a little bit. Yeah. He's pissing yeah. me off. Yeah. And then like next week, it'll be Steve. Yeah. Steve's fucking, just doing that sh shit again and then like eventually it gets to the point where you have a talk with steve and then you work it out i, I yeah. that's one side of me that i still like kind of despise like i i, I find myself like kind of but but you know what though you're not the only one in in the, you you go into a if you go into a serious band you're with a bunch of dudes you gotta expect something like that's gonna happen you just gotta be reasonable and work your shit out you know like it if Steve's fucking up, yeah, I mean, then fucking Steve's fucking up. But is he gonna be mad because you're talking? Unless well, it's you're more, trying, it's like, more of a, up, but... it's more of a therapeutic thing. You're just like, okay, you're, yeah. you're 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 agitated at a band member, so you're gonna like vent off some steam. And then if you're faced with them face to face, you don't even bring it up because it's not that big of a deal in reality. <laughs> That's more yeah. or less where that spawns from. But I I don't know if anybody listening is like thinking about, you know, 
that band dynamic or like they're really pissed off at a certain member or whatever the hell like honest to god if, if they're not like as long as they're doing their fucking job and like not pissing in your kool-aid like yeah man get, that shit's got to get let go you're never gonna make it that's another thing too uh i don't know if this is gonna spawn into like hey tips and tricks to fucking making it in a band my greatest piece of advice for any project up and coming especially in today's climate like just don't stop doing what you're doing because longevity has proven time and time again to be a significant uh, way of getting places in the industry. I think uh, most of the underground success stories that you hear, it's like 10 plus years of grind before they get what they do. I mean, our, our friends from like the band Macabre fucking buckled down over and over how many years, you know, doing their thing and the touring and all the shit it takes, but they kept the same name, they kept the same style, they kept, and now they have a brand. You know that that's proven to work. I've I've had the unfortunate band history of a lot of breakups, and I think there's a lot of musicians that fall into that category where you're bouncing mm-hmm. around and you never get things to work out. But there's nothing more important than keeping a name and keeping the brand out there as long as you can. I think that's like the 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 big secret in the sauce or whatever. You're either extremely good and undeniably talented, or You've been a, you've been around long enough to be a veteran, and eventually somebody recognizes you have enough talent to be like on the road with and open or whatever else, and they'll give right. you throw you a bone. Or you're extremely talented and you have no fucking identity either, you know. Man, and then you're playing in the streets and you end up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know what this is gonna turn into exactly either. But yeah, I, it's. <laughs> running a band or you know running it, it, going at it and I, I don't know you know who i would be speaking to at this but you do see this on the local level a lot is like well, let me say this my i'm let me gripe about the local scene for a while and i think and i'm just kind of airing out some maybe some frustrations i had with the local scene but there is too many fucking bands and there's a lot of garbage out there and not to sound arrogant or anything like that, but it's true. And I think that has damaged over the year. I know I watched it from when everything started. I watched local shows packing people, you know, hundreds of people and down to local shows pack. I don't know. I, and you could, I haven't played in years, and you can tell me, I mean, are they, you know, is, is there a revival going on or not? But I, I watched it dwindle down to 30, 20. I mean, we've played for five people, you know, it's happened. And it's a lot of sour tickets and stuff. And, you know, I think, it, I think when uh, we were running through terrorizing back around 2012, uh, that was the downswing of, playing those like little club spots playing those like you know the underage slash you know whatever venues and kind of like bouncing around like we did and being you know at that time there were a lot of crap bands and everything else and there's still there still are a lot of rough bands and stuff like that and it's like it's easy enough to to stand apart from that scene nowadays being older but i don't know if it's because just because you're older so you don't you don't play in somebody's basement at a fucking party house. You don't you know play well, at the fucking like, the the CD store in the back room. You know like there's there's a difference yeah. in quality of venue now. When you're older, you understand. Well, I, I, I think that rise of the rise of that screamo scene that that came out and we're getting to like music philosophy, I guess here like or song philosophy, but like that that's when the screamo stuff came out for a while i'm like that stuff never translated well live right and used to get a lot of like good rock bands and you know heavier bands and and there you know from my understanding no one really had a problem with metal bands or anything like that but when you got to like that weird screamo shit that a lot of electronics but people are playing at really small venues and i actually just seen something a couple years ago when i was in milwaukee i saw some local bands playing and it was fucking awful i mean it was it was horrible <laughs> You know, heavy synths and things like that don't really translate well to two PVs on a fucking, you know, fucking six foot stand. 
and you, you see a lot of that stuff and it's I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, for bands out there who may come across this, I don't know, you, you got to be a little more self-aware when you're playing shows and understanding, one, what your sound is capable of, and two, um, what what audience are you playing for? So many bands will play for weird, really strange... We've done it. I mean, oh, for sure. really strange places that you we should probably should have never played in the play show to play a show and you know this isn't me telling you what you should and shouldn't do but this is me saying what i've seen in my experience and um i i think there's something to just being a young band and really spending the time and thinking about where what is your plan for playing out you got to have a plan for these things and um Moving forward, I, I mean, I I will never play in a fucking live band again. I know that for sure. It's just I don't one I don't have it in me, and two I think like my body is garbage, and I don't <laughs> want to fucking go through all that and playing out live and get all sweaty and gross and lugging your gear and all but, that shit. You know? There's still there's still yeah. that there's still a rush there. There's still uh you know, and I haven't played yeah. in in a long time, but like the. <sighs> I don't know, like when you're talking about like what a what an upcoming band should do, it's like it. It's like you got it. You got to go through the grind and you got to get your feet wet. So then it's like, okay, do we just play as many shows as possible? Anything we can get? Because me and you have been in projects where it's like, yeah, anything that comes our way, we're fucking That's going. We, did. we drove. Yeah. We drove for hours on end to go fucking play in a basement in Iowa, or we drove mm-hmm. to fucking Flint, Michigan, because there was like some opportunity there. So we would just get. And even, go. But even like, let, let, I'm going to hold in your thought, but even like those basement shows, like to me, that made sense because what were we? We were a screamo band and that's where we belonged. Like we, <laughs> we belonged in that, not saying like we could never, you know, screamo bands don't belong playing in like big venues. Absolutely they do. But when you're up and coming, you don't go play a fucking at a band shell on a Sunday afternoon at a battle of bands with fucking Leona and fucking Gretchen or walking scotty their little fucking dog down this and you're screaming about fucking whatever the fuck it is you guys scream about these days i don't know (laughs) but like don't what are you doing don't do that you know like it's there it's things like that and and a lot of it is it's not even the band's fault it's poor promotions and it's poor you know uh organizations people put together these shows and things like that but uh, what i what i guess what i'm trying to say is that if i had this knowledge you know going forward instead of being enamored with being in a band you know when you guys picked me up for great town fire i was fucking ecstatic i've been trying to get in that inner circle of yours for fucking <laughs> I, I had to tell you long. i was i had to tell you you weren't in the band like twice before you finally got in i tried out a bunch of times and you had to tell me I, and this is the guy who shut me in the locker we're talking about shit about a band i never talked shit about but anyway i was a dick um <laughs> but like you, you know and if if you know i don't, I don't even know is, is this shit even gonna fall on deaf ears probably but i it, man there's just so much like time brings you and, and it, it, it's fascinating that how much your mentality changes over the years just from the experience like being in bands is one of the coolest things ever just from the, from the, the looking through the glass of wow i've grown you can see your growth, you know, just through the years and even musically. I mean, even the stuff I make now, it's incredible. Like I, I was just going to tell you, I made a fucking country song <laughs> last week. Wonderful. I sang it and everything. <laughs> and it's, I don't know why I did it. I, I was thinking about doing it for our project. I'll talk to you later about that, but, <laughs> that's fine. but I, I don't know why I was even, that's not a good, de- and that's again, here we go. That's not a good decision. Cause what we're doing isn't for that fucking, that's not our audience. I don't know why I did it. Now you never know. But at least I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> at least I recognize that though. Right. Like before it's just like, I made it, put it out, you know? And it's one of the cool things you can really see your growth from over years and see your maturity. So to my to my understanding, if like we actually had to like, like I said, if this somehow like, if you're an up and coming musician and you try, you're like, I don't even know if that's going to be a thing in ten years. Like, are there going to be bands? Yeah, I, but I want to, 
I want to give some advice, uh, understanding a little bit of the music industry nowadays um, and the opportunities that are there. If you are creating a reasonable buzz locally where you have enough diehards, every time you play, you get compliments, you watch your videos, and you recognize that you look good and in control at your shows, just put the money together and buy on tour with an appropriate band and start the grind. Yeah. Because honestly, like, that's one thing we were too fucking stupid to realize that we could have done, even though it's a good thing we didn't because we sucked. You know, like... If I if gain the band I'm in now, if gain was around back in twenty twenty or two thousand five, two thousand six, no, I would yeah, say I, mean, I would say we should buy on tour and fucking ride this out. Oh, for sure. Um if terror when terrorizing was going, it was like we we actually were a talented band, but we didn't have the look or the the stage presence locked in yet. So then if we would have bought on tour, we probably would have kicked ourselves in the ass. But musically, that band could have went somewhere. So it's interesting yeah. being able to look back on the catalog and recognizing like what might have worked, might what wouldn't have worked, and all that kind of stuff. But rewind it way back, and you think like, okay, you're starting off. You're thinking like, oh, I want to make it big as a rock star, or whatever the hell. You have to truly understand whether or not if you're good or not, and you don't have to be good in the sense of like an amazing player. You just have to have energy on stage. You have to have a front man or a front presence that is incredibly commanding, like just dominates the stage, looks at the crowd, controls the crowd, controls the energy of the room. If you have those things going, go buy on tour and put it, put your, uh, put yourself out there because that's, that's your best bet. You're going to, you're going to, yeah. nothing's going to give you more exposure than that. Unless you're talking like digitally nowadays, because this is, you know, it's interesting seeing the trend in the change in the music industry now towards this digital frontier. Yeah. But um, yeah, maybe it'll fall in deaf ears, but maybe not. Maybe there's somebody thinking about yeah, it. It's I not. So. It's not fucking easy. And uh, I failed. You failed. <laughs> like how many people have failed yeah, over the lots. years? And I don't know if you call well, it failures. I played. I I had. I'm still in music, so that's fun. I had a yeah. lot of fucking cool shows to talk about. I got to be on the road briefly. You know, there's little little sprinkles of fun. So I got my stories at least, but I don't know. There's a lot of people that never leave their basement. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, and, and I can't, I, I can talk more on the writing aspect of things than what I've known. Cause I, you know, I, as far as I haven't been in the game playing live for fucking ever, you know, and I know, I know your band gain has made a lot of like probably more headway than any of the other bands has, has ever made, you know, and you guys are doing really well in the fucking And we're not, and we're not excited about it yeah. <laughs> because we're so yeah. like, we're just like, we're, <laughs> we're so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We're so realistic about where we're at as a band. It's, it's hilarious. Cause we just show up and like, you know, we open up for some of these national acts and they're like, Oh shit, you guys would be a fucking great opener. All this stuff. Can you, you know, can you do this show here? And, like no, no, I gotta get back to my job. And like, oh, you guys aren't under a label or anything? No, no. sorry, sorry, we have lives. <laughs> I've never well, been and, so and unenthusiastic and <laughs> having so much buzz around a band my whole life. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's but maybe there's something to that too. But you you know, but being self aware, I think, is one of the most. And it sounds really simple, but it's not that simple when you're in a band. One good show can destroy your self-awareness immediately one fucking banger of a show one banger of a night can destroy your self-awareness immediately i and i've been there and it's in and it, it, is it embarrassing to actually admit yeah it kind of is i mean you have i mean we've played like banger fucking nights and you're like dude this is it this is the break we need now it just fuck it, it's gonna happen or you get like a fucking you know some shady fucking label deal or something like that you know and you think it's it, you almost lie to yourself at times like is the song good is the album good do we look good on stage those are things you got to be self-aware and honest with yourself you know yeah, i don't think i don't think any project um we really had all those boxes checked off <laughs> no no but, but we, we continued uh, on and it never was resolved you know it was never None of that can, stuff was ever actually ever fixed. You know? Can we can we revisit like how wrong I was about image being an important factor, and also how right I was in the same stride? Because you you yeah, you, can't, 
whatever you do, just don't do what I did and just be yourself in your address. Go one or the other. Either go fucking balls out or keep it clean and uniform. One or the other. Just don't yeah. be in the middle ground because that's where I landed. Yeah. <laughs> don't be the sore thumb well and it's I, I think me and you have always kind of like had different philosophies on that like i've always wanted to go full out theatrical like Nerf that was always my best yeah i wanted to do something <laughs> just really flamboyant and fucking like you know i just i, I like the idea of that you know i like the idea of just going out there making a statement this doesn't mean i'm right if you have if you don't have the right guys who are gonna fucking do it doesn't mean i'm right you know at the time i thought it was but so like how, how far did you want to take it? Are you talking like making like, like dress, dresses, like, wizard costumes? Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't have done anything hokey like that. But I mean, but I mean, along those lines, yeah, I was all about like just like neon suits, sort of. Yeah, of it being neon suits or something. You know, obviously, I have a fucking flair and a taste for the electronic stuff. You know, it's just me. But um, yeah, I wanted to do this whole like. So I have to po I'm going to poke your brain now. So no, you have that mentality. You want to go to that extreme, but mm -hmm. then you show up for a show in a Nerf fest. <laughs> was that like, was that like you digging what? through your closet? Like, Oh, oh I gotta find something. That's gonna there it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll have, you know, that Nerf fest had plenty of compliments that night. Cause I but, fucking um, did that with that vest I bought. I like went into a store. I was like, oh, oh I gotta find something cool. I was like, I'm going, I'm getting this. And I got it. I was so proud of my vest. And I bought a fucking pair of boots and then like I showed up to that one gig. I only wore that shit at one gig. And everyone was like, man, you look really cool. And I was just like, I felt so not me that it, yeah, fuck, it yeah. fucked with me because there's that too. Well, again, and, and these are two examples of what not to do, right? Like, I wanted to be fucking stick out and be goofy and zany, you know, goofy Josh wearing a fucking nerd. Is that helping the band in any certain way? No. You going out and buying a vest out of pure panic. Is that helping the <laughs> band out? No, it's not. It's none of this helped the band. But again, that's being a musician. It's so hard not to be self-absorbed because you, when you get past the point that you are putting on a show versus your band is putting on a show, I think that's a much different aspect. You know, you're out there in stage. You're worried about what you're worried about you. You're worried about yourself. Am I going to look cool? Well, maybe that's not the philosophy to have. Maybe is the band going to look good? You know, that's, that's, that's a really, really different way to look at it. There's so many, there's so many like oversights and so many like little, little things you don't actually, that really do fucking matter. And that's one of them. Yeah. yeah like, you know, worrying about yourself on stage instead of everybody else. Yeah, definitely need to spin that around because you need to be your band all together. If if he's moving, yeah. you're moving. If you're, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than uh, having it be completely uncoordinated. And I've seen that, and I've been in projects like that. And it it wasn't until recently. I think that's like that's one thing I can say that Gain managed to pull together. Like our our live stage show isn't like. We kind of talk to each other and dress as close and uniform or whatever, you know, black, plain, no big logos of anything. Like we have our basic wardrobe kind of decided, but yeah. performance and like, you know, learning. One thing I learned how to do with this latest project was like having confidence on stage to look at the audience. That mm. little bit is a piece no, I, I was missing that. for years, looking mm. at the audience and not just like, looking up and then getting scared and looking back at your guitar like no looking and staring right at somebody and then looking over yeah. and it like looking around yeah. like yeah. you you have that shit down to a science you don't have to look at your guitar or think about it like finally getting past that like you don't like it, it's weird all the years that i put energy into moving on stage like the few minutes that I've held my head up and looked around at people are more engaging when I watch video playback. That's more engaging than any kind of jumping around nonsense yeah. because it's, it's commanding, it's confidence. It's uh, looking the part, you know, you go watch any major band. If you're like thinking you know, like, what does it take to have like good stage presence? And like, you're going to see an air of confidence when they're playing. And it's not just because yep. they know the songs in and out. It's because they're actually, staring right back at you and like yeah, yeah it's mostly lights in your face and you can't see anybody but you still pretend like you're making those engagements because if somebody's watching you and you make eye contact with them it's like a 
it's like a re-engagement that triggers in humans like naturally just to be like yeah. oh there it is they're gonna watch a little bit longer and maybe you do that really hard before you do like a fucking trick or something silly or if you're like me and you do like the worst guitar trick ever and you hold your guitar <laughs> up and just shake it and put it back <laughs> oh yeah that was, that was classic the... how many let's let's roll back into how many fucking stupid arguments did we go through over I, like i'm trying to picture like some specifics i remember just the fucking fighting and screaming over like what over what were we fighting remember about this one this was a good one remember this one it should go versus it should go dun remember that that's uh that was my rib theory i was talking about before it's the same <laughs> shit does it fucking matter <laughs> does it matter did who, that change who, make who, the song any better or worse was that uh was that billy pu pushing for that or was that me it was billy geo you and me who who was the one that wanted to change it billy okay <laughs> months uh, i think two months uh, that was an argument i was like the um, oh god i mean it was there was a lot of things like that i remember um getting un into arguments about style and all that other kind of stuff and like um there's some the, okay bands just have a bad bad tendency to like go down the rabbit hole things that just don't matter like even even like as important as tone is it's just as equally not that important because I've seen yeah. bands have horrible tone. They play with like a line six or whatever, but they were fun as hell. Nobody gave yeah. a shit that the guitar sounded like scrambled eggs because like well, distorted yeah. guitar is also not like a very clean no. sounding thing. Anyway, no. uh, yeah. you mix cymbals in it. You're not going to hear details anyway. So I think again, I think that goes into tone. It goes into self-awareness and identity. I mean, you can pull off a really rough shit sound and be a fucking killer band. There's nothing wrong with that. Pantera is a prime yeah. example of shitty tone. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if you're going to be pulling off a shit sound, but the sound of your band identically should be this fucking production, you got a fucking problem. If you're not in step with the rest of the band, again, just having an identity. If you're not in step with the rest of the band and and that's the problem you know we we never i don't think we've ever really discussed that is that we never look at it that way in our old projects was going what what does what does our band sound like you know we've talked about genre we've talked about you know adding elements into it but we never talked about like from building it from bottom up what 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 does the, what should the band actually sound like and i'm talking about not musically i'm talking about just tonally you know i don't think we've ever talked about that interesting i mean i think uh i, I, I always think of, uh, well, i always kind of place that with like the style or genre uh, more or less yeah but like when it came down to breaking down tones and uh, stuff i never think about guitar tones yeah there, there's plenty of that but it was always like, we'll match mine. Well, mine's doing this. Do they blend together? You know? And it no, was no, like, it's, it's that never worked. <laughs> like no. we, we never had that figured out. Like I, 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 I can, I can honestly admit that like, I have a hard time with like heavy guitar tones. I do. I just, my ear can't pick up like the, the distinct, tough, distinct variants that like pros, like true pros get. But there are things that I like that are different you know like uh what is that amp um the sunbather i think it is um has a very nasty like sludge metal sound to it that i always liked and if i showed that to like you know let's say like billy or somebody else or even you or whatever and played it and you would just be like Ugh, you know like you get that like <laughs> like well, what's wrong with you and it's like I guess like a good example is like look at like Deftones like when you look at their older material mm -hmm. nobody thought that that guitar tone sucked and now that I'm even bringing it up if you're listening you're probably questioning it but if you if you solo that guitar tone out especially on like the uh you know House of Flies or whatever then you know that that's, that's nasty dude you listen to it it's it's just it's scrambled eggs it's just like a very it's mm -hmm. 
you know, I don't even know if it was solid state or not, but it has that kind of like a very unattacky smush yeah. smushed sound to it. But it worked. It worked with the style and it works within the band because there's only one major guitar tone through it. Um, whenever you work with another band, leaving space for them to operate in. And that's the funny thing, too, because it's always like, well, he's the brighter guitar, so I'm the darker one. It's like, that's such a dumb shit, like, way of describing it. It's like, yeah. it's like one, if, if somebody's playing leads, you know, like, that doesn't make, that doesn't mean they're the brighter one. That means they're mid heavy. They should be cutting. Yeah. And then, like, what does that mean for the rhythm side? Well, if you're not, if your rhythm guitarist, doesn't fill in the mids and your lead guitarist does when they do the mids then when you have your rhythm parts they're going to sound weak so it's like no you need a blend like you were saying you actually have to have like guitars damn close with each other mm -hmm. and just little variances to make them stand out for like yeah. lead stuff but that's also like boosted you know you give it a db boost or whatever just to get that to stand out but that that's the interesting thing i'm learning about um multiple guitars and you know whether you're in bands or uh moving into yeah. record recordings it's not about oh he's the high and i'm the low it's like no like we're like this but like if you like turn it sideways then you'll start noticing that we take up our own responsibilities but when you look at it from a frequency spectrum it's they're very very close i think yeah. that's a big misconception well i think a lot of people too is they don't listen to uh, and i used to be really guilty of this when i started doing like recordings and mixing listen to your guitar tone with the bass guitar you have to you literally have to i mean it's because it, it, that could really honestly make or break your the whole sound um there there is a harmony there between the bass guitar and the electric guitars you know if you got somebody with shit conky conky that's the best word i can think of it is conky conky <laughs> bass sound the puppet from fucking trailer bass, park <laughs> voice <laughs> bass sound that's what I was, if you have a sound of bass it sounds just conky and bullshit your guitar is probably not going to sound that great. I mean, it's just, I just think it's the way it is, you know, and I, I've learned that too. I, bass will mask so many things live. It's insane. But don't go, not saying go bass heavy either, because that's a fucking mess. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't do it too. They just listen to guitars alone. Like, again, this goes back to everything. Like the whole, you got to listen to what the whole band is doing. It's, there's a harmony between everything goes with the drums and synth and all that stuff you know i used to get so upset live like i never thought and 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 i always prided myself like oh man i'm never that way until you realize you are that way i have, a, I have some and, i have something to say on your end <laughs> oh well no, i think maybe maybe that maybe i'll admit it here what you're thinking so i used to pull this shit live and this is probably the most ignorant and worst this is probably the worst thing i've ever done in a band and the most ignorant thing i've ever done in a band is that you go to sound checks and you just feel like you're just getting cut out every time. You don't fucking know what you're listening to and you're doing the sound check. All you get is monitors. You don't listen to the mains. So I used to take my, my synth and I used to tap the fucking volume down a little bit. And Jared always look at me and Jared go, you all the way up? And I'd be like, yep. You all the lying way up, piece man. of shit. <laughs> and I was a lying piece of shit. And I'd fucking, and I, I, it probably sounded like fucking ass. You know, it probably did. Earlier in this and podcast, to, like, Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say earlier in this podcast, you know how I was talking about Steve and how we, I would talk shit about him doing something that would piss me off. <laughs> that was one of the things about me. Oh my god, we talked so much shit behind your back about like, dude. I think Josh. <laughs> I think Josh turned the fucking synth up at that show because it sounded fucking horrible. Front. Do you think he did that? Yeah, I think he did that. God damn it! And then we never, we never just fucking said it to you. Like what a, what a wait, what a waste of time. Like hey, Josh, <laughs> stop turning up the fucking synth. You're destroying the show. Know. We should have oh, known. Yeah, also, we showed up at a gig one time, and he literally blew up the side monitoring system in Janesville. Do you remember that? You fucking you pulled that shit. We start playing. All of a sudden, you hit a bass oh, drop. Ooh, it sounded it. like it sounded like the fucking building exploded. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody on stage looked at each other like, <gasps> "What the fuck just happened?" Yeah, it literally and, and honest to God, that that's the worst thing you can do. That's like one of the biggest sins you can make live. Like and it's dishonest and it's it, it's horrible. You you yep. should just never fucking do it. I mean, I don't feel that bad that I did it. There's really always a weird air of arrogance, like when you're younger in this industry or if you're uh maybe big headed or whatever, where you think like you just 
you just know that the sound guy doesn't know what they're doing so you like take the power away from yeah. them but the problem is when you do that you're throwing them a curveball that's going to piss them off and what does a shitty sound guy do when you piss him off he stops oh, he stops trying to help you he stops trying yeah. to help you so keep that in mind like it it's always better to deal with somebody that's not as good but they're trying than somebody that'll just be like well fuck these guys <laughs> yeah he'll they'll fuck you up you'll be done uh, how do you like uh, remember we were guilty of this a couple of times sound guy comes up to us hey how many mics you need five how many people use mics live one it's, <laughs> it's did we wait, we did we we did that Oh, a bunch of times. Want to make sure everyone had a mic. Never fucking used them. Did or we? Half, you know, half of us would sing harmony. Wouldn't sing harmonies when we were supposed to, or things like that. I and never, I, I never had a microphone. No, yeah, you're one of the ones that wouldn't get one. Marty got them sometimes. It was funny. Why did Marty get one so we could hear him go fucking when he fucked up? <laughs> <laughs> my one of my favorite memories was. Uh, well, what happened? Like, I think Marty split his pants and he ran <laughs> off. We're in Chicago. <laughs> he tells everybody he split his pants, ran out of the ran out of the the show to go change or something. And we all we all thought he said he shit his pants. Well, yeah, it, I spread that fucking rumor because I, I see I think it was Jeff. I think it was Jeff. And he Marty told Jeff. So Marty went running off the stage. Right. He's you know marty's this fucking guy he's drums you know big sweaty guy so marty goes running and holding his fucking pants and i look at jeff mouth his words and he looked like he said marty shit his pants and then he said split so i started telling him like dude marty shit his pants so everyone thought fucking poor marty ran off and shit himself and he didn't that was one of my favorite mini i don't even know if you could really call it a tour i mean we did lead the state yeah, i guess didn't we like we? or no no, that wasn't that wasn't like the same four, gig. It was a four night, four nighter. Yeah, what the we hell? We did four shows total. No, no, it was three. We're misremembering because we did Milwaukee, then we did Janesville, then we did Milwaukee again on that one run, and we're mixing up Chicago as part of that. Chicago was a one off. Oh, because I thought, well, no, didn't we start somewhere north and go to Milwaukee? Because I think we stayed. Oh no, maybe. No, I got it. Camp one night. We stayed by my sisters a night, right? Yeah. And then we and then we were tossing up getting a, a motel another night. So that's three nights. That was two that was two somewhere. different runs though. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the camping night was one where it was like not all of us camped, I think. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, that's another tip too. If you if you're a young band and broke, camp camp as much yeah, as you so can. Cheap. Cheap, cheap, cheap. very affordable and there's really it's kind of interesting too you don't have to tour the fucking world to tour one unique thing to do is regional sweeps like if you get a weekend like drive go play a show friday night and then drive somewhere saturday and come back sunday at least you got that reach going in different areas yep. and you can start branching out like i always wanted to like get that circle completed but we ran out of time and got old <laughs> i don't know that's just nowadays the thought of like touring is like oh I, I mean it's still it's still kind of appealing because okay honest to god like it was fun as fuck but like the the touring that we did with uh terrorizing was like luxury touring for because we were all adults we all had jobs we had money so we went on tour and like got hotel rooms went fucking water skiing went, <laughs> went you know like it wasn't a bad stuff. it's not it even like, like you couldn't really even consider it a tour but nobody has that reality when they're fucking touring like that's just what yeah. we made it because we were like oh fuck we're going on vacation yeah. so but that was one of my favorite things that i did at, we did as a band i don't know what it was it just I felt we felt i felt like at that moment we were very uh union i or unionized i don't know together i guess together or a unit united, united. what a better word <laughs> to use for that um but we, if we were in, yeah we just get into like, our rising stuff or not but well i guess i'll brush brush through that like that music that music to me when we started uh because i started with like me mike and mark writing shit that i kind of pieced mm -hmm. together with mark and like we kind of like that was like my very using every brain source i could to create cool guitar riffs that i was proud of 
that band will always stand out in my in my mind as like my passion project because so much heart mm-hmm. and soul went into those songs. And I think most of us all kind of felt that way as we built those songs because there's so much different than standard music. There's so much layers there. It's organic sounding. Yeah. Even the recording process was like actually real. You know, it wasn't sampleized. It wasn't fake. It was still cabs. It was still, yeah. it's a very, very beautiful unique sounding album and i fucking i loved it it was it could have been bigger it could have been better but what we got out of it was fine i was completely it was, a, it was the musician's album you know it was that's the way i look at it is um it, it sounds like it was made by us for us you know kind of a thing and i appreciate it for that i think it's um i was proud to be a part of it you know really was. Sure. I, I thought it was it was really cool, and it was something that we kind of talked about doing for a long time, and we just did it, and it was awesome. Marty, uh, Marty, to this day is the best drummer, most talented drummer I ever worked with, but also the biggest, one of the biggest pains in the ass, <laughs> in all reality. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many times he he said yes to something and then just ghosted, but <laughs> I after after the years it just became like a normal thing. So now it's like not even really <laughs> much of a thought yeah, on it. Once, once you expect it from somebody, it's not so bad. And that's all part of the letting go of that shit too, and just like moving forward. Because like yeah. that that was such a power us too. Because Mike, uh, Mike on lead guitar. Now, mind you, Mike's not much of a writer, but he's a th- when he does, it's fucking beautiful, and he's a really he's a really talented I have musician. Yet, you know, I, I have yet to hear one thing Mike Loveless has written all the years I've been around Mike Loveless. The the never little, heard a single thing he's like on his own completely. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Even that, well, the a lot of the lead stuff that he did on Terrorizing was like that was all on him, you know. It's, well, okay. I let me let me. I, I'm excluding <laughs> leads from that. I'm talking about like just like a a, a song. song. <laughs> you know, there's something Larry, beautiful in there. I know there is. But Mike, being the caliber uh, lead player that he was, then you have um, Marty being the drummer he was, and you have Mark who was fucking not only like so different and appropriate for the music, but a very, very powerful, you know, vocalist and, uh, dynamic. Yeah. Yes. It was just, uh, it was a very unique, unique project. And then you had like, you were like an X factor and bringing in like very odd, you know, electronic of kind of like experimental shit to the mix. Jeff being the perfect bass player of just like, okay. <laughs> and then like me being able to kind of write anything, I mean, I I would write the weirdest well, stuff like Katamari. I remember writing that in the studio in front of you guys. Yeah. And me and Mark were all jazzed up. I was like, guys, listen to this stuff. And you're like, that's so fucking stupid. I don't want to use that. I was like, no, this is a fu- it's going to be a fucking hit. It's going to be a banger. And we just pushed it down your throats. Another <laughs> uh, song we never finished, but Rainbow Roof Barber Booth. I remember writing that in Marty's uh, Wood Shack. And just uh, yeah. I kept playing the riff over and over and looking at you guys like, can you not fucking hear what I'm playing and I just kept playing it and looking at you guys like do you, are you hearing this riff right now because I heard it isn't that as the this, most frustrating thing and you can't deny that it's a fucking extremely catchy fucking riff like that's <laughs> that's gold it was fucking gold from what we were doing See, you're doing you're doing that thing we talked about yeah I mean yeah could have been gold depends what else goes with it but you we, know, we finished it, that one it was a great song <laughs> Well, did we even finish that? Yeah. Oh, so good. Why don't I remember it? <laughs> Mike Mike fucking recorded an arpeggiated lead that matched out your keyboard. You don't remember that? Could you send me that when you get a chance? I don't remember. I don't that. know where it is, but no, he he recorded. He had to slow it down because the sample. Oh, sam- that's right. The sampler had this oh arpeggiation. God. So he wrote an, arpe- an arpeggiated that's fucking right. harmony lead to that. Which is just insanity to me. It was just <laughs> so. It was um, really painting. Sure. Yes. Yes. And that that was a cool fucking tune. It never got finished. Finished, but it was. We played it out a few times too. And I oh, loved. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that it went from such a happy space to that real dark. You know, at the bridge. Dark, you know? dark, and it was yeah, just simple. Yeah. It was like I wrote this. Um, like these deep notes were just dumb, dumb, dumb. You know, like. Yeah. But it, the yeah. mentality behind that was like, okay, I'm going to play, you know, this fucking, you know, uh, B to A or whatever, just a whole step fucking open up. 
and I want a piano to fucking hit the same low notes. And like you'd use that, I forget what the theory behind that is, but you layer a lot of the same notation, but with different instruments. So it gives mm -hmm. like more dramatic effect. Cause mm -hmm. it, that's what I always felt like that band was. It was like writing in an orchestrated style of like, yeah. you know, you know, really br was. bringing in like a, an epicness to it. You know, cause we were like, we're such a mixed hodgepodge of video games and like Lord of the Rings and, and it never came off. It never came off really cheesy to me. The only the only oh. song that ever came off cheesy was that uh, um, Shadow Warrior. That was the only song that I couldn't stand that we worked on. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. That, that band was neat. I mean, it was exactly how you, I, I like how you put that. I was like, that's perfect. It was really, you know, when you write orchestra pieces, it's actually something I've been like learning lately, and. Um, you take your instrument and you do things with it that you fill in spaces in the most sometimes surprising ways, you know, like, like I said, the way you utilize guitars and that's what made you, you know, that's everyone had like this X, everyone had an X factor, really something they brought to the, that band, you know, you had the ability to, to just figure out your guitar in ways that normal, you know, that aren't traditional, you know, and Mike was this powerhouse lead and, and it was, yeah, that the, the band was, it was something, you know, it obviously had its flaws. I mean, it really did, but that album was, like I said, a real, a real blessing to be a part of because it was, it was special. It really was. I just, uh, I don't know this, we could probably wrap this up, but, um, I just remember when we finally got to the point of having a physical copy in my, mm -hmm. in my hands, I like, I, I fucking teared up. This is, that was like one goal. I just wanted to be, I wanted to write one. I am. Yeah, I got it. You're crying. It's okay. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get that one album written and recorded just to, just to say I fucking, cause I was, I was a part of so many EPs and all these stupid demos yeah. and, yeah. Even our pawn, the fucking six truck, uh, six track, ten track thing that didn't actually have ten tracks. Yeah, yeah, mess. Like none of it was legit to me. Like here we are. We recorded. We wrote and recorded an album that had album art. It was under a label, kinda, <laughs> and it came self in rap. So fuck yeah, that was a big deal for me. And I, I, I do miss those parts. I mean, I'm still having fun with music nowadays. I still. Uh, I still enjoy it. I love the writing process. I like being old and mature about things now. It's like, it's not mm -hmm. mature, but it's like just, it, it's, it's really bizarre. Like I have no, like I have freedom, like if, you know, working with you or, you know, I've some, once in a while I'll, I'll write some stuff on the side with Mark and whatnot. And it's like real, it's real easy to just say and speak your mind now. And that was always such a challenge. I don't know why, because you're always afraid of feelings but if you can just if you can get past that barrier and just look at it at face value, be like, well, I like this stuff and it's OK that you don't like this stuff and yeah. you like that stuff and it's OK that I don't like that stuff. Th that's it. Like once you figure that out, <laughs> truly, you'll have a better yeah. chance at writing material because like now I'll I'll send you the like I said, I mean, said it in the beginning of this, like I'll send you the dumbest fucking riff. And like somehow you'll surprise me. You'll like put a bunch of shit to it that just like makes a dumb riff. Like uh, the best best riff I think that you worked on was probably Jellyfish, where it was just like this stupid fucking. What did I write? It was like bap bap da da bap bap da 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 bap bap da da bap. It's so fucking. And you just like nailed it. Nailed it with like the most appropriate amount of cheese sprinkled on it to make it make sense. You know, you took a cheesy riff and you, you amplified that style to make it like so on point and it was no longer cheesy. So I don't yeah. know. I don't know if that's how you view that one, but yeah, I mean, it, I don't, I don't even, it's like when you send me, I almost, it's probably weird to say this, but like you send me something and it's just like, I feel like, I, I know what you want me to do to it. Like you communicated with me somehow through <laughs> the magic of music. <laughs> but I don't know. It's just, it, it honest to God, dude, when you send me this stupid shit, like it, 
it doesn't take long. I'm know, always, it, I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised by your reaction because sometimes I'm just like I'm waiting for that. Be like, what the fuck is this? I'm always waiting for that reaction. I, I send it. Send, yeah, you're always like, oh sweet. And I was just like, come, like, come on, come on, no way. <laughs> like I think the yeah that I have. I don't think I heard you do anything with that one yet. I'm I'm looking forward to. It. I wrote that mega death sounding one. Honestly, God, that one I'm struggling with. I ain't gonna good, lie about good. that. Yeah, I'm struggling. You gave me one. I'm having a hard time. How I do not make this sound like fucking no, cheese dick. But no, no, make it. Give me half yeah. of Make it make it mega deathy as possible. I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it specifically for that. No, and I don't care. Like I don't care if it doesn't work. You know, like if you got nothing or if yeah. it just is a it just is a shit. Like that's that's freedom well, no, in see, music. That's yeah, it is. But I also I'm like of the belief and like I I, I enjoy the challenge because it's I don't know it's just, it's like playing a hard video game. It's just like I I refuse to believe until I'm proven wrong that you can't make anything sound cool. Or how, you know, and again, it's all, it's all our opinions, you know, just because me and you think something sound cool doesn't mean it is. But uh, well, but if we do, other people will too. Sometimes, you know? sometimes and, I think things, it's weird. Sometimes I think, I think things sound cool for other people. Does that make sense? Like yeah. I look at something and be like, I fucking hate that. But I know, I know it works. I know it makes sense. I know the type of person that's going to like that. I know that it's, it's like a weird outside perspective of things i get i get wrapped up into music discussions all the time with other guys where it's like oh it's just it's too fucking cheesy or it's too you know this or blue it's like yeah it's to you <laughs> if you want you. If, if that's all you're worried about is like writing for yourself and that's fine and that's fine if you are but yeah. if you are if you're focused enough on recognizing like universally where it'll land you can get so much more done you can get so much more done uh, yeah if you're looking to sell out then don't worry about it like just sell out i mean it's <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that i mean what is really selling nothing out wrong with it. like what and, is and what is selling out? but li listen to some of the shit that's out there that's that are hits you know and it's always it's always been this way since music you know i'm sure i'm, I'm sure back in the days when fucking Tchaikovsky and fucking beethoven all those guys were out they're probably like huh that sounds cheesy <laughs> I would never, you know, but it, I'm sure that that argument has been going on forever, man. I mean, it's, it's music and it's all opinions and, and, but you know, what sells, you know, you want to write math metal, dude, fucking write math metal and fucking kudos to you. Cause I want nothing to do with it. Cause that shit's too fucking hard. But if you want to, you know, and if you want to write fucking cringy pop music, dude, fucking do it. Like Rebecca, black it up, like whatever, do what you got to do it's music man it's not for you it's not for me it's not for it's for everybody at different times you know that's that's the other thing too like um this is a little out of order but i always like the um writing something and then like just being like fuck yeah we really wrote something sweet and then a week later you get to practice and you try to play it it's it yeah. sucks this why does this suck now we gotta drop it it's like you fucking idiots like you had it it was good i think that i'm glad you brought that up i think that makes me more wild than anything else just had a giant giant centipede come climbing down my fucking wall are your are your toes okay i don't know i'm looking for him <laughs> uh, jared's not gonna be relaxed now he hates those things where did it go he's he's waiting for you to go to bed oh there he is Got my eye on yeah. you, son of a bitch. Should I kill him? No. Oh. He's like, you're going to sleep yet? I've been nibbling on your toes all week. This is staying in the. This is this is staying in here. <laughs> Get a sweet ah, little treat underneath. Oh, he lost it. Ah, shit. Ah, fuck. <laughs> you probably had legs are fucking flying everywhere. I don't know where I'm it went. Get me that bath. Gonna get my sweet little treat tonight on your feet. Lick underneath your toenails. I hate those things. <laughs> I don't know where it went. <laughs> this isn't fun at all. <laughs> this is great. I'm glad this is in here. Nice studio. You got peds running around without. It's like the Wild West out there. No, I don't like it. All right. White... <laughs> what a great conversation, guys. All right, we're gonna end it now. <laughs> I'm too stressed out. I'm gonna get my toes bit. <laughs> Fucking this badass wide herp 
peed running around your fucking. Oh, it's the fucking goddamn springtime. That's what happens. What kind of crazy creatures you got over in Missouri? Ah, uh, fucking velvet ants. Oh my god. And they bite. Cow killers. That's what they're called. You ever seen those things? Now are they huge? They have one of the most painful stings in the world. And their actual uh, stinger is probably about this long. A velvet ant. Look it up, dude. It's horrifying. Did you ever see a centipede? We yeah, have seen a centipede. You used to live in that apartment I lived in with the house yeah, of peeds. Yeah, there was a bunch of them in there. It was infested. Did you ever worry about them? You just let them climb on you? I grew up in a grew up in houses in Milwaukee. They all have them. Well, I'm scared like a little bitch here. <laughs> oh my God! Stop. You're all right. right. Okay. All right. We're gonna end it now. <laughs> I'll probably trim all, all right. this out of here. <laughs> no, leave it in. <laughs> I don't know. We got it. We got well, a lot of good content. The uh, music industry is something. <laughs> sure is something. <laughs> You want to give it a rating of a fucking Coca Cola, a Diet Coke, or a seltzer water? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to rate it. I'm just going to, we're going to get out of here. The one offs are going to have their own little charm. Yeah. That's right. good. <laughs>